Hi everybody, welcome to Inspirited Live. I'm John Spellman, and tonight we're going to be talking about the book of Revelation, Among the Lampstands. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would bless us as we study your word this evening. We pray that you would guide us in our understanding and in our study of the book of Revelation. We pray, Lord, that you would open up our minds and hearts to understand these things, and to also obey those things, which you would have us to um, do in, in these last days. We pray that you would forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of our unrighteousness so that we can uh, be better in tune uh, with your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I'd like to start off by looking at uh, Revelation chapter 2 and starting at verse 7. The Bible says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. So last week we were talking about um, the context of the book of Revelation, how John the Revelator was um, exiled on the Isle of uh, Patmos, and um, God began to speak to him uh, through dreams and visions. And God had a message um, to the seven churches. Now, it's very important to understand that this book was not just written to those seven literal churches, um, but rather it was actually a communication from John to the whole world. Um, or to the uh, to, to uh, all of Christianity, um, and one of the ways that we know that is the fact that even though this book is written to the seven churches which are in Asia, uh, in terms of how it was addressed, there were way more than seven churches in that region, um, whom John, you know, as he's as you as you're thinking about the postal route, um, the each of the churches is written in accordance with the postal route, uh, but when you look at one destination to the end destination, he's skipping and bypassing several churches. And the number seven has always been significant uh, throughout Bible um, prophecy and so forth. So the fact that um, several churches were, were, were skipped and specifically uh, he only addresses the letter to seven churches shows us that there's more here, just like all of Revelation, than meets the eye. Uh, so the seven churches... Um, represent something. They're symbolic of something else. And like we see throughout much of the church, uh, sorry, the book, of, the book of Revelation. So for example, you got um, uh, John talking about Jezebel or Balaam in, in Revelation chapter 3. But yet, by this time in, in, um, in uh, you know, uh, the 30s AD, those people have been long dead for, for, for hundreds of years. Uh, you have... Um, so many different Old Testament uh, symbols and, and um, illusions that much of what we see um, transpire in the book of Revelation is symbolic. And the book itself even tells us that much of what we're going to see is signified or, or symbolic. So taking that under, 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 um, under consideration... Um, and how the number of seven has always been symbolic throughout Scripture, not even just in Revelation, uh, we can see that what's what's described here in Revelation chapter two in in uh, addressing the seven churches uh, is also symbolic. So there's a literal meaning in Scripture, and then there's also a prophetic meaning. So Psalm seventy three describes the psalmist um, being concerned about the un the ungodly. Okay, so anyway. Looking at Revelation, uh, sorry, looking at uh, Psalm chapter 73, uh, the psalmist is constantly concerned about the ungodly. Um, and he discusses how, as he looks around at uh, the things that uh, people are doing, that how they live in abundance and ease, in contrast to the suffering of the righteous, um, that he becomes perplexed and, and states that his steps have almost well nigh slipped. Um, and it's not until when we look at verses 16 and 17 that he says there in the presence of God, he was given a deeper understanding of, of this matter. It, it basically says there in, in verse 16 and 17, uh, it wasn't until I went into the sanctuary, then I understood their end. Through his connection with the sanctuary, in going into the sanctuary, uh, the psalmist basically has a revelation uh, and, 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 and becomes more aware that the situation is beyond what he originally thought. Whereas he thought that God was just letting wicked people get away with, e with everything, um, it turns out that God was, in fact, uh, fully aware of the matter and in control 
of the matter. The Bible says, when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. So something about being in the sanctuary caused the psalmist to understand that the situation wasn't, even though uh, it looked bad, uh, didn't mean that God was not in control, didn't mean that God did not understand the situation, didn't, didn't mean that God wasn't doing something about the situation. But rather, he has a new perspective once he enters into the sanctuary and understands from God's perspective exactly what's happening and, 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 and what uh, God has planned for the wicked. And then he goes on to say in verse 17, until I, uh, sorry, in verse 18, surely you, you, you did set them in slippery places. Uh, you cast them down into, the, into destruction. How are they brought into desolation as in a moment? They are utterly consumed with terrors. So he goes from basically thinking that God is doing nothing about the situation to understanding exactly what God is doing about the situation. And even though at first it looks like the wicked are prospering and getting away with everything, he sees in the end that they're getting away with nothing, but actually are, are set up in, slip, in slippery places just awaiting a fall. Um, so in the understanding of the sanctuary, there is, there's uh, a reveal of, of, of the knowledge of God and how God plans to deal with the problem of sin. And of course, uh, the, the prevalence of the wicked throughout the earth. And as we look at the, the, our study here in, in the book of Revelation, um, again, we're, giving, we're given a view of the sanctuary. And through this revelation of, that, 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 that uh, is revealed through the sanctuary, um, we are going to see that the wicked also are in, are in slippery places and, and basically um, that even though things in this world may look gloomy, they may look uh, like the wicked are prospering, ultimately God is in control and has a plan to deal with this issue. So in that sense, the book of Revelation is a book of hope because it not only reveals to us end times, not only re reveals to us uh, the nearness of the coming of Jesus, but it also reveals to us how God is dealing with the sin problem at times when people think that it's happening, it, nobody's doing anything about it, and people are getting away with it. Revelation chapter 1, verse 9 says, I, John, who also am, am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So John is a guy who's going, who's gone through persecution. He was not exempt from, um, you know, from, from, from situations that play out here on earth. John went through persecution. He was banished uh, to, the Isle, to, to the Isle of Patmos uh, because of his uh, consistency in preaching the word of God. So he had been through tribulation and he was exiled uh, because he was preaching God's word, specifically uh, testifying of Jesus and he, and he also and, uh, prophesied of Jesus. So these things show us that he was persecuted for doing the right thing. So if anybody could identify, um, you know, uh, with being persecuted for doing the right thing, John is definitely one of those people. But yet, while he was on the Isle of Patmos, which was, which was intended to give him discouragement, God brought him encouragement, and the, and the Isle of Patmos turned out to be a place where John uh, received light from heaven. Uh, where he was to be cast into, into darkness, he received light from heaven. And uh, it revealed um, that God was still in control, God was aware, God saw the things that were going on, and that God had a plan to deal with these issues, and that the coming of Jesus ultimately is near. Now, early Christian authors living uh, relatively close to the time in which the book of Revelation would have been uh, written unanimously state that uh, Roman authorities had banished John to Patmos because of his uh, faithfulness to the gospel. So he endured hardships uh, of, of, of Roman prison. <clears throat> Let's go to another passage. We're going to go to Daniel chapter 3, uh, verse 16 to 23, and we'll see that this isn't the first time in history that these things are taking place. We find that um, throughout Scripture, anybody who stands up to do God's will often meets with persecution. So let's go to Daniel chapter 3 and verse 16, which says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, 
O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer you in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of, thy, out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which you have set up. So here we see an example where uh, Nebuchadnezzar builds this golden statue and uh, tells everybody that they have to bow down to it. And the three Hebrews refuse. Uh, and so Nebuchadnezzar gets so angry that he decides to heat the furnace up seven times hotter. Why does he heat it up seven times hotter? Uh, you know, every, uh, throughout, throughout Scripture, we see the significance of the number seven. And Nebuchadnezzar knew that that number meant something to the Hebrews. And so as an insult, not just to the three Hebrews, but also to their God, he orders the furnace to be heated up seven times hotter. And what's interesting is the last thing he says before Shadrach and Meshach make this statement, he actually says here in uh, verse 15, Now if you be ready uh, at the time that you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the heart, the sackbut, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall, uh, you, you fall down and worship the image which I have made. Well, but if you do not worship, you will be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? So essentially, he, he issues a direct challenge to the one and only God. Because he says here, what God is going to deliver you from me? And so Shedrach, Meshach, and Abednego point out, hey, our God is able to deliver you. Now, you got to understand the significance of what's being said here. Because Nebuchadnezzar, um, you know, he, he did have that, um, that experience with Daniel in chapter 2. But this pagan king thinks that because he had conquered Jerusalem, um, that somehow the gods of his nation must have been stronger or better or, or, or more powerful than the gods of the Hebrews or of, or of uh, the Israelites or, or, or um, the people of Judah at this point, they were called. Um, but what's interesting is that he didn't realize that in conquering Jerusalem, this was something that God had already preordained long before Nebuchadnezzar even came on the scene. So, whereas he thought, as many of the pagans at that time did, you know, they, they figured that as long as they were able to overcome a nation, that it meant that their gods were stronger than the gods of the nation that they conquered. But, uh, so, so basically, with that kind of mindset, he issues a challenge to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, saying, who is the god that's going to deliver you? Do you think your god's going to be, I mean, we conquered you guys. Do you think your god is going to be strong, strong enough to deliver you from my hand? And that's why the three Hebrews respond saying that their God is able to deliver, but even if he chooses not to, they are not going to worship the king's gods or bow to the statue. And so in a rage out of, out of anger at this statement, Nebuchadnezzar orders that the furnace in verse 19 be heated up seven times, hot, uh, seven times hotter than its, a, than its, um, than its uh, usual heat. And keep in mind, this is completely unnecessary. I mean... Uh, if, they, if they had just been thrown into the furnace as it was, they would have died. But out of rage and insult to, uh, to, to what these three Hebrews had said in, in daring to, to suggest that their God was more powerful and could deliver them from the hand of the king, he, he's basically saying, oh, really? Let's see if that's true. And heats the furnace up seven times hotter. So this is not just a direct challenge towards Shadrach, Mejak, and Abednego. This is also a, a challenge directed at God. And so there again, you see how the number seven is is uh is significant and after and and the, the furnace was so hot that once the three hebrews were thrown in the men that threw them in died from the very heat of the furnace so they, they the, the men who were throwing them in the furnace didn't even get you know didn't go inside of the furnace but the sheet but the, the the heat and and the power of the of the flames from um uh from inside the furnace were so powerful that it killed them while they were the, while they were throwing the three hebrews inside What's interesting is that after being thrown into the furnace, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are able to walk around inside of the furnace, and there's a fourth person in the, in the furnace, and as Nebuchadnezzar takes a look, he says, it looks, like, uh, it looks like the Son of Man. And so this is Nebuchadnezzar's in direct encounter with Jesus, and he calls Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego out of the fire and, and uh, bows himself in honor of their God, realizing that uh, their God is the only true God. This again shows us 
how God has made his presence felt throughout history, and also the significance, again, of the, of the number seven. This is why when we see that the book of Revelation is written to seven churches, um, even though, and it's, and it's skipping and bypassing several of the churches in that region, um, it's showing us that Revelation means something here that is beyond just what it says at face value. Uh, we see that God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh. He blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. Um, that is why uh, in the commandments it, it, it tells us to keep holy the Sabbath. Uh, in the sanctuary system, uh, you had the seven um, candlesticks. Okay, again, that was significant. Uh, Jesus talks about in the book of Revelation the seven stars. Uh, there are seven seals, seven trumpets. Um, uh, of course, the, the seven churches, as I, as I was talking about before. So the significance of the number seven uh, should be noted. In another instance, we see with the, the stoning of Stephen uh, in Acts chapter 7, verse 54 to 60, and how God's people have, to in, have endured hardship. So um, Paul talks about how on numerous occasions he endured hardship, being stoned, being beaten up, being thrown into prison. Uh, so God's people have always gone through hardships as they preach and share the word of God. So persecution is not uh, uh, strange to, uh, to Christians. In fact, the Bible says all that will live godly um, will, must suffer or will go through persecution. So the fact that um, people are going through persecution is not an indication that God has any, in any way abandoned us or that um, you know, we can't count on God. And so the book of Revelation gives us hope and inspiration in times when we're going through hardship because it shows us that even though we may be going through things, God ultimately is setting up his everlasting kingdom and he has a plan to deal with the sin problem and to ultimately punish the wicked. Hello, can you hear me, Doug? I can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, well, I just uh, caught the uh, tail end of what you were saying about hardship. We have to endure hardship, and that the Bible characters, like Stephen, have endured hardship, too, and that God saved them through those hard hardships. But um, I just wanted to bring up the point that uh, on the question on Sunday's lesson, January 6th, at the bottom there in the highlight on the regular quarterly, it says, How can we understand the difference between suffering for Christ's sake and suffering for other reasons? including our wrong choices, and then it goes on and asks questions, or how, what about suffering for reasons we cannot fathom? And then the highlight, the one I wanted to answer was the last one, how can we learn to trust the Lord in every situation? Mm -hmm. And I think how, how we can learn how to trust the Lord in every situation, even hardship, is to pray without ceasing, what Paul, Paul brings out, that pray without ceasing, and um. I think I'm um, bringing out the scriptures that um, uh, from um, First Thessalonians chapter five verse seventeen. It says, "Pray without ceasing." And verse eighteen it says, "In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you." And then it goes on verse nineteen: "Do not quench the spirit." So I just want to bring out the point that we should always pray when when we're in temptation we should pray when we're in trial we should pray and when we're when life is going easy and life is going well mm -hmm. we should pray and, that, and I think that will help us to resist temptation and, resist, and to be joyful in trial when we're when we're suffering. Amen. Amen. And as we uh, pray in faith, the Book of Revelation. Um, gives us hope that our prayers are being answered. It talks about how, um, in you know, uh, the incense uh, rising with the with the prayers of the saint uh, of the saints. Um, you know, it, 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 it's showing us that God hears those prayers. Uh, so when we pray in faith, yes, we may be going through hardship. Yes, we may be going through uh, through difficulty, but God hears those prayers. Um, and so, just like in the Old Testament, you had the. Um, uh, the incense that was offered with the with the prayers as part of the uh, morning and evening sacrifice, even so in the New Testament, as we look at the story, as we look at the book of uh, of Revelation, we see that God um, has incense that's rising, uh, and of course that was a symbol in the in the uh, in the book of Revelation for 
how their prayers are being heard and covered by the blood of Christ and by um, you know the um, intercession of the of the Holy Spirit. Let me just let me just grab that text. So Revelation chapter eight verse three and four it says, and another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the, with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. Okay, so again, it's showing us that, that um, our prayers are being, are being heard in symbolic fashion, just like uh, what, what took place in the, in the earthly sanctuary back in the Old Testament. Uh, here, uh, a similar process is described in the New Testament in the heavenly sanctuary. So we're going to look at Revelation chapter 1. And verse 10 for a moment. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Now, this passage has been a cause of, of, of controversy uh, because uh, roughly around, uh, I think it's like the third century or so, I should really look up the dates, uh, but, off, uh, but um, uh, people came to call the Lord's day Sunday. Uh, but yet scripturally, the only day that's ever referred to as the Lord is uh, the Sabbath. So when John says here, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, um, the question comes up, which day is he talking about? And it's clearly the Sabbath because in John's time, this, I mean, remember John is Jewish as was Peter, as was, uh, Paul, as was many uh, of the apostles, you know, uh, the early church was a Jewish church. These guys all kept the Sabbath. Um, and so when he says that he's in the spirit on the Lord's day, he's talking about the Sabbath because the Sabbath is the Lord's day. Um, and that's why throughout scripture, the, the Sabbath is called, um, you know, um, the Holy of the Lord, honorable. Uh, it's called um, uh, the, the, the Sabbath of the Lord. Um, so the, the, the Sunday never came to be called the Lord's Day up, up until much later, long after the apostles uh, were already dead. And this was, of course, something that was done uh, through, um, you know, through Rome. But in this time, uh, the apostles had never referred to Sunday as the Lord's Day anywhere in Scripture. And so uh, we can clearly see that because of the fact that Scripture is consistent with calling the Sabbath the, the, the Lord's Day, um, uh, well, uh, calling the Sabbath, you know, the Lord's, uh, that when John says that he's in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, he's clearly uh, referencing the Sabbath. Let's take a look at a couple of other passages that sort of uh, support this point. We're going to look at Exodus chapter 31, verse 13. Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths, so notice what he says. He says, My Sabbaths shall ye keep. For it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that ye may know that I am the Lord who doth sanctify you. So notice that the Sabbaths are called the Lord's. These are the Lord's Sabbaths because they're the Lord's rests. Who was it that rested on the first Sabbath? It was God who rested on the, on the first Sabbath. He created the world in six days and rested on the seventh. And, that's, and, and, and in resting on the Sabbath, he blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it for, all, for humanity to keep. So the Sabbath is the Lord's. And that's why throughout Scripture he calls it my Sabbath. Whereas when he's talking about the Sabbath of the land, like the Jubilee, he calls it you know, either the Sabbath of the land or when he's talking about the Sabbath of, uh, of the Hebrews, uh, like you know, um, the Day of Atonement and all those other types of Sabbaths, he calls it your Sabbaths or in some cases, the Sabbaths of the land. Um, just give you some more references. Uh, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 3, says, Ye shall fear every man his mother and his father, and keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Uh, verse 30, same chapter, Ye shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. Uh, Leviticus chapter 26, verse 2, you shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. Uh, verse 43, the land also shall be left of them and shall enjoy her Sabbath. So there you can see how when it was the Sabbath of the land, like the Jubilee, it was called her Sabbath or, or their Sabbaths. Um, Isaiah chapter 56, verse 4, for thus saith the Lord unto the, unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths and choose the things that please me, and take hold of my covenant. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 12, 
Moreover, also I gave them my Sabbaths. So notice that the Sabbath is constantly referred to throughout Scripture as God's Sabbath. It's his Sabbath because he's the one who rested. It was his rest on the seventh day, and he blessed the day and sanctified it and invited us into that rest uh, so that we can celebrate and memorialize creation and God as the creator. Now let's go to Isaiah chapter 58 and verse 13, which says, If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy, thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. So look at what he says here especially in verse 13. He says here that the Sabbath is the holy of the Lord. Um, it's honorable. And on it, we are supposed to honor him. And before, just before that, he says, turn away your foot from the Sabbath from doing your pleasure on my holy day. So notice there you see that the day of the Lord, the Lord's day, his holy day is the Sabbath. So when John says, I'm in the spirit on the Lord's day, um, the only day that God had specifically set apart for himself was the Sabbath. Okay. Now that doesn't mean uh, that there weren't other days in which they were to worship, but simply uh, it was it was talking about, you know, for example, if we look at uh, Leviticus, we'll see that there were other feasts and, and, uh, and, and uh, Sabbaths, but those were always referred to as either Sabbaths of the land or um, Sabbaths of, of the people. Uh, so sometimes in talking about Israel, they say her Sabbaths or uh, the Sabbaths of, of, of Israel. So these were Sabbaths that the people were to keep in worshiping God, but God specifically took ownership of the seventh day of the week, referred to it as his holy day. So if John is in the spirit on the Lord's day, he's in the spirit on the Sabbath. Uh, Matthew chapter 12 and verse 8. For the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath day. So the Sabbath uh, would have to have been the special time in which God, uh, you know, in which uh, you know John is referring to here, uh, because the Sabbath is a special time of communion with God. And so even while John was imprisoned on the Isle of Patmos, he could still enjoy communion with God on the Sabbath and did. So more than likely, John would have been looking forward with, with anticipation of future events, uh, especially on the second coming of Jesus, which would mean the end to his suffering, especially on the Isle of Patmos. And so on the Lord's day, John could enjoy the, the special time in which to commune with God. And this particular Sabbath, uh, God chose to give John uh, this revelation uh, and talk about the events leading up to the second coming uh, in order to strengthen him, encourage him, and let him know that his hope was coming soon. So John was talking about the time at which he himself had the vision of, of these future events, and that it was on the Sabbath, the Lord's day. And on this day, he received just kind of a foretaste of what was to come of his, of his expectation, uh, that Jesus' is coming was near. So I want to make clear that um, there is no passage of Scripture where... Sunday is ever referred to as the Lord's Day. And in fact, in all the passages I read to, the only day that is ever referred to as God's Day has been the Sabbath. Uh, throughout Scripture, I showed you all those different references where the Sabbath is referred to as my Sabbath when God is talking. Uh, I also showed you Isaiah 58 where, it's, where he, he refers to the Sabbath as my holy day, whereas the other festivals which occurred on different days or different times of the year on the, uh, on the uh, Hebrew calendar was always referred to as maybe her Sabbaths or the Sabbaths of the land or, or you know, uh, other terminology. So those linguistic markers show us that God only took ownership and possession of one particular day. Of course, God owns all days because he's the creator, but he specifies particularly one day as specifically his. So, okay, so of course, God owns all days, right? And we can worship on all days. However, uh, only the Sabbath is specified specifically as God's holy day. Um, and with that point in mind, that means that it's a special set apart time or, or period of time in which we can have a special communion with God. So we can have communion with God at any time, 
uh, but the Sabbath is intended to be a special communion with God. Um, just like when we think about how uh, we have birthdays. You know, somebody can celebrate the fact that we're here on earth uh, any day of the week or any day of the year, but the birthday is a special time in which to celebrate a person's life and means that they're a year older, so it has special significance. In the same way, the Sabbath also has special significance. Um, so uh, the Sabbath was a special set-apart time that God created uh, to commune with his creation. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 12, we're looking at the, sorry, Revelation chapter 1, verse 12 to 18. The Bible says, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as, it, as if it burned in a furnace. And his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his, hand, his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And had the keys of hell and, and death. Actually, the uh, Greek there says Hades and death. Uh, so Hades was the transliteration of Sheol, which meant the grave. So he's basically saying here, and had the keys of the grave and death. Now, let's also take a look at Daniel chapter 10, verse 5 and 6 for comparison. Then I lifted up mine eyes... And looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of euthaz. His body also was like beryl, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes like as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like, like in color to polished brass. And the, voice, uh, and the voice of his, words like the voice of a multitude. So again, you see that even in the book of Daniel, the similar figure is described to that of Revelation chapter 1 and verse 12. So here, we're looking at a depiction of Jesus that's, as he's dressed in this priestly attire, and he's interceding for us. So he's doing the work of intercession. And Jesus is walking among the lampstands, pointing to, uh, which essentially is alluding to or pointing to God's promise in, to ancient Israel that he would walk among them and be their God. And if, if we look at the New Testament, that is the promise of the New Testament. He says that I will write my law into, in, in their hearts. I will be to them a God. They shall be to me a people. So God is walking amongst the midst of his people. Uh, just as he promised to be Emmanuel, God with us. He's walking amongst the churches. He's walk, walk, walking amongst his called out. He's with his people. If we look at Leviticus chapter uh, 26 and verse 12, the Bible says, And I will walk among you and will be your God, and ye shall be my people. So again, using uh, similar language to that of the new covenant. God is walking amongst his people, walking amongst the called out, the churches. Uh, so in, in Greek, the, the Greek word for church is ecclesia, uh, and that word transliterates called out. So in Revelation, uh, the lampstands represent the seven churches in Asia to which, the Revel to which Revelation was originally sent. Um, and as, and as we'll, we'll, we'll see as we, as we move forward, the lampstands also symbolize God's church throughout history. So the lampstands are, 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 uh, are the seven churches, and the seven churches are, of course, the seven that are, that are mentioned. Um, however, uh, this wasn't just literally addressed to the seven churches, but also to the seven, uh, well, actually, actually to all, all churches. Uh, and, and even when these, these um, like, for example, when we look at Revelation 2 and 3, there's a message for each of the seven churches, right? But what's interesting about it is that the letter is only one letter. So in the letter... Jesus addresses the seven churches specifically, like, you know, he'll talk about uh, Ephesus and then uh, he'll move on to the next one all the way down to Laodicea, but they're written as one letter and were read in those churches as one letter, showing us again that he's not actually writing uh, seven, se seven separate letters to seven churches or seven individual churches, each letter to be dropped off at each church, but he's writing one letter to all the churches. So again, this is showing us the symbolic nature of, of Revelation and how the, ch the seven churches uh, may not necessarily have been literal. Uh, 
not, and when I say that, I mean that there were literally seven churches that, that had those names. But the uh, but in talking about in terms of the symbolism of Revelation, um, those letters written to the seven churches might not have been directly um, referencing uh, the literal seven churches, but rather the symbolic um, uh, time periods uh, that each church represents. So they more than likely went to those seven churches, lit the seven literal churches, but they had widespread application for all churches and prophetically had another significance that was beyond just what you literally read in the chapters. Um, so Revelation really is written to all people throughout time, and uh, the seven churches represent the seven time periods in which, um, you know, leading up to the second coming. And we see something similar, for example, with Joseph's dream. Remember when Joseph saw seven fatted cow, uh, calves? Or he saw seven, um, uh, the corn stalks, I think it was. Um, when each, one of those, when each one of those things represented a time period or a year of Egyptian history. Uh, and so they were going to have seven years of famine. Uh, sorry, seven years of, uh, of, of, of plenty and then seven years of famine. So first he sees seven fatted uh, animals, and then he sees seven uh, thinned and, and, uh, and um, uh, starving animals, uh, representing seven years of plenty, seven years of, of, uh, of drought. Uh, so my point is that, again, you know, Pharaoh had way more than seven, than seven uh, uh, um, animals. You know, he had many animals, uh, way more than seven corn stalks. Um, so the number seven there was significant, representing a time period. Now in Revelation, uh, the seven churches don't represent seven years, but rather seven time periods in, uh, uh, you know, of, of, uh, of, of Christian history uh, leading up to the end of time. But we'll talk more about that in a few minutes as we get to that, uh, uh, that symbolism. Um, but a crucial point to bring out here is that Jesus will be continually with his people until the time that he returns um, to be with us in person uh, as he uh, brings in the everlasting kingdom. So this image of Jesus walking among the, the churches or walking amongst the, uh, the lampstands shows us that even though he may not be physically here walking on the earth, he is with us and he is interceding on our behalf and he is uh, acutely and, and, and fine-tunedly aware of what's going on uh, here uh, and uh, aware of our affairs, of our, of our challenges, of our setbacks and all the things that are going on. And through his ministry in the sanctuary, he is providing help for us. So the daily task of an appointed priest was to keep the lamps in the, in the holy place burning brightly. Uh, the priest would have to trim and refill the lamps. They would have to replace wicks on the lamps. They would have to refill them with, 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 uh, with fresh oil and then relight them. So uh, the priest uh, became personally, uh, uh, sorry, the, the priest became acquainted personally uh, with the situation of each individual lamp. So for, for uh, Jesus to be depicted as walking among the lampstands shows that he's the one who is replacing the wicks, uh, refilling and trimming the lamps, refilling them with fresh oil, relighting them if they need to be relighted. And so he is acutely and, 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 uh, individually and personally aware, personally acquainted with each individual lamp. And of course that represents the church. So he's uh, individually and, and uh, um, he's individually acquainted with each church um, and, and, and is in the process of, of, of uh, ministering to them, uh, you know, providing them with what they need to burn brightly. Oil in, in scripture also is a symbol which represents the Holy Spirit. So it's Jesus who supplies us with the Holy Spirit so we can carry forward his work. Um, the, the light represents the word of God. Or, uh, you know, uh, uh, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. That's why the, the candlestick here is used as a symbol for the church. Um, so Jesus is the one who keeps us burning with light so that we can have light to show the world. Without Jesus, um, you know, giving us that light, we would, be in, we would have darkness. We would have nothing to share. And so he's the one really who, who uh, is responsible for keeping um, his, his people burning brightly so that we, we have a witness that we can share with the world.
Let's look at Revelation chapter 2, verse uh, 2. We're going to look at a couple of verses, actually. We're going to look at verse 2 first. And this is written to the church of Ephesus, where it says, I know your works and your labor and your patience and how you can't bear them that are, which are evil. And, that, uh, and, and you have tried them, which say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. Verse 9 I know you're, uh, this is written to the church of Smyrna. I know your works and tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of them, which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Verse 13, I know your works and where you dwell, and, and where you dwell, even where Satan's seat is. And you hold fast my name and have not denied my faith, even in those days where an Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. Verse 19. I know your works in charity and service and faith and, and your patience and your works and the last to be more than the first. Uh, when we go down to Revelation chapter 3, uh, looking at verse 1, it says, And unto the angel of the church of Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works, that uh, you have a name, that you live and are dead. Verse 8 says, I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, and no man can shut it, for you have uh, for you have a little strength, and have kept my word, and have not denied my, my name. And finally, verse 15, the church of Laodicea, he says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. So here we see that Jesus is deeply invested and cares about and knows what's going on in the church. So he takes special notice and is able to give them a specific and intimate detail about what's going on with their affairs. So God is not a far off, uninvested, uncaring, and un unconnected with, uh, with uh, what's going on in, in, the, in the experience of the church, but rather he knows everything that's going on. And so... Um, you know, he is deeply invested and, and could speak to it. Now, when we look at the fact that uh, Jesus refers to himself, one of the titles that he uses to identify himself is the first and the last. Uh, and that's, that's uh, one of the titles that God used, as we see in Isaiah 46, 44, verse 6, and 48, verse 12. So he, he applies his title to himself. He says he's the first and the last. Now, the Greek word that's used for last is eschatos, and that's where we get the word eschatology, dealing with, like, last events or end-time events. Or, or the study of end-time events. Um, and the meaning of this word shows the focus of eschatology is on Jesus Christ. Because of his death and resurrection, Jesus has, given uh, Jesus has been given authority to open the gates of death and the grave. All who trust in him will rise from the grave and have everlasting life. And so when we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 21 to 23, and also 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 to 17, these passages describe the resurrection. And so all who are going to take part in the resurrection are taking part in it because Jesus uh, had the victory while he was here on earth. And because of his victory uh, in dying and rising again, we have the promise of a resurrection uh, that because we trust in him, uh, he has the power. Uh, sorry, uh, because we trust in him, he, he will raise us up. And he's able to raise us up because he has the power and the keys of the death, oh, sorry, over death and the grave. So he can unlock death, he can unlock the grave and call us up and we can be reunited with him. And that's why in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, Paul was giving, his, uh, giving people hope in the church uh, because they thought that only people who were alive at the second coming of Jesus would be able to be resurrected. And Paul was assuring them, hey, not even, de not even death is going to prevent people from, from enjoying the resurrection. So he says, you know, I don't want you to be ignorant about those people who are already asleep. But he says to them, hey, you know, when Jesus returns, uh, you know, he's going to descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So because Jesus has the power over death, he could say, death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? Because he can call people from death and give them life. And we got glimpses of that as we, as we looked at the New Testament, where Jesus was on earth and he resurrected people from the dead, like Lazarus, uh, Jairus' daughter, and others.
And so that's why when when uh, when Lazarus' sisters were crying, he says he says to them, you know, um, I am the resurrection and the life. Let's look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 11, 19, and 20. Saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, what you see, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. We're going to look down at verse 19. Write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which, you, which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the, gold, and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the, are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which, uh, which you saw are the seven churches. So Jesus spoke distinctive messages for the churches in Asia. But like I was saying before, the fact that there were more than seven churches in that province suggests in general about the, uh, about the symbolic significance of these messages for Christians. It probably wasn't written specifically for the seven churches, but symbolically, uh, or, or rather was a symbol, the seven churches were a symbol of the church as a whole throughout time. Because again, remember, you have seven seals, seven um, uh, trumpets, each representing time periods or periods of time in, in, uh, in, in, history, in Christian history um, leading up to the second coming. So, like, for example, you, you look at the sixth seal, the seventh seal, uh, the sixth trumpet, the seventh trumpet, all describing end-time events. And as you'll see as we move forward, we're living between the time of the sixth and seventh seal. So, again, I would... I would uh, there are some scholars that suggest that there's a historical application uh, to these prophecies, meaning that the seven churches located in, in, um, the, prop, in the prosperous cities of, of uh, first century Asia, uh, they suggest that, they were several, uh, that there were several cities set up uh, uh, that, that were you know, set up in uh, emperor worship in their temples and, and uh, you know, were, were paying homage to, uh, and loyalty to Rome, and that this was done out of compulsion. So uh, many of these cities were given um, uh, these compulsions, or, 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 were trying, or they were trying to be forced into um, worshiping either Roman gods or, worship, or, or, or worshiping the emperor. And many Christians, of course, in, in this time period would refuse to participate in these practices, and so they faced trials um, and even at times martyrdom. So a historical application would suggest that um, John wrote the letters uh, to the seven churches as a means by which to give them help and, and encouragement at times when they were dealing with these challenges. Now, the prophetic application is where we're talking about how Revelation is obviously a prophetic book, and there are a lot of things that you can't take literally. For example, Jesus does not literally have a sharp sword coming out of his mouth. As we saw in Ephesians, the sword represents the Word of God. Uh, the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit, and so when Jesus is described with a sword coming out of his mouth, it's simply a reference to the Word of God coming from his mouth. So Revelation is a prophetic book, but only seven churches were chosen to receive its messages. The spiritual conditions in, in the seven churches coincide with the spiritual conditions of God's church in different historical periods. For example, right now, we are in the time period of Laodicea, and our church is, I mean, uh, you know, the church as a whole, like, you know, when we, when we look at all of Christianity, it's perfectly described by Laodicea. Uh, so essentially, uh, from heaven's perspective, a, a panoramic uh, survey of the, of the spiritual state of, of Christianity from the first century to the end of the world is portrayed through the seven churches. And of course, there's also universal application where uh, on an individual basis, or even on an individual church basis, we all kind of go through those different stages that, that are described in the, uh, in the seven churches. So we can apply it personally uh, to our own individual situation. But the prophetic application is important, where we have to look at these as the, as the seven time periods uh, from, of, of Christian history, stretching from the first century all the way down to the end of time. Because think about it. What did John say he was being shown? He said, write the things which are... Sorry, uh, let, me, let, me just, let me just read that part again. I'm going to go there. Um, in verse 19, he says, write the things which thou hast seen, past, the things which are, right, present, present, 
and the things which shall be hereafter. John was to write about past, present, and future. So the things which he saw, he personally witnessed, the things which are present right now, and the things which are going to come. So we're looking at uh, the things which John saw from his time in the first century all the way down to the end of time. And when we look at the book of Daniel, the book of Daniel did the exact same thing. The book, the book of Daniel revealed things that were in Daniel's present time all the way down to the end of time. So Revelation is essentially picking up where Daniel had left off, expanding and giving us greater detail. So again, each of these seven churches represent uh, time periods in Christian history leading up to the second coming of Christ. And right now we are living in the time period of Laodicea. And remember, the book of Revelation is the, rev the revelation or the revealing of Jesus. When does the revealing of Jesus take place? At the second coming. That's when the Son of Man will be revealed in power and great glory. And because there were more than seven churches, and seven is that number of completion, symbolically, we can see that uh, these seven churches uh, more than likely have prophetic application and are not necessarily intended to be looked at as literal, a, a literal seven, um, seven messages to seven literal churches. Think about it. If you're writing seven letters to seven different churches, um, why write them all as one letter? Why send each, uh, each letter to those seven churches? What about the other churches in that region? How come in, in that region? How come they didn't get a letter? Were they doing everything perfectly? So these these things show us that um, much of what we read here about the seven churches is prophetic in application. So Revelation's emphasis is on the second coming and events leading up to it, um, and so this book has has global um, import and impact for all Christians, not just the seven select few. Uh, just like how in, in Joseph's time, the seven cows or the seven um, uh, corn stalks or what have you uh, weren't representing literal uh, cows or literal corn stalks, but were representing seven time periods uh, before, seven time periods of, of famine, seven time periods of plenty. And of course, when the, fam when the famine eventually came, um, you know, they had to store up good, uh, they had to store up stuff in the times of plenty to be prepared for the famine. So in the same way, as we look at the seven uh, churches, uh, we can see where we are on the, on the prophetic timeline and be prepared for the second coming of Jesus. So just like they had to be prepared in Joseph's time, um, we got to be prepared in our time. So let's take a look at the message to the church in Ephesus. So Ephesus is the capital uh, and the largest city located in, uh, on the major uh, trade routes. Uh, it's the chief seaport of Asia and very important uh, and had very important uh, commercial and, and, and uh, religious centers, right? So, um, you know, it was it was a place where a lot of commercial uh, trade and so forth took place, and uh, was also the epicenter in some ways of, of religion. It was known for the practice of magic and was notorious for immorality and superstition. So, in sending this, uh, in in in, in uh, describing the church of Ephesus, let's take a look at what the Bible says. So, looking at Revelation chapter two, verse one to fourteen. Sorry, just one to four. Revelation chapter two, verse one to four. And unto the angel of the, of the church of Ephesus write, These things say of he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them, which say they are apostles, and are not, and have found them liars. And hast borne, and, and had patience, for my name's sake, uh, have labored, and have uh, not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. So Jesus holds the seven stars, he's described as holding the seven stars in his right hand, walking in the midst of the seven lampstands, or in the seven churches. He um, presents as, as, as one familiar with their, word, uh, with their works, and they hold fast the, the faith. Um, he, he says that they hold fast the faith, but they've left their first love. Now, a couple of things here. First of all, if you, if you look at the book of Revelation uh, and how it describes Jesus walking in the midst of the seven lampstands, is Jesus only walking in the midst of seven churches, literally? Think about it. That wouldn't even make uh, that wouldn't even begin to make sense. Jesus is talking about his people as a whole. So these seven churches clearly are not a reference to just the literal churches in, in uh, the literal seven churches in Asia Minor, because even if you, I mean, if you look at the at the way that um, 
the postal route went in that region, um, they're all in the form of a circle, basically. So when you start at Ephesus and you end up at, uh, at Laodicea, you know, you would have gone in, 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 a, in a circle. So uh, especially in the order that this, is, that this is discussed in. So Jesus couldn't walk in the midst of only those seven churches without also walking in the midst of all the other churches that were in that region at that time. But yet he is described as only walking in the midst of these seven churches. Yet this book clearly, in describing end time events uh, from John's time all the way down to the end of time, has end time significance that it applies to all people. Uh, and today those churches aren't even around. So the fact that uh, Jesus is described as walking in, the seven, uh, walking in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, which represent the seven churches, is a clear cut, clear as daylight reference to the churches throughout time. Uh, each church, of course, representing a different time period. So to suggest that he's walking in the midst of literally seven churches uh, would be to really misunderstand uh, what's, what's being described here. So if this were literal, you know, he obviously would, would have had to have had some more um, lampstands there to represent the other churches in that, reason, in, in that region and how he's walking amongst them. But he chooses the seven for a reason. And the fact that the sanctuary always had se uh, you know, seven candlesticks um, is also significant. So he's describing the heavenly sanctuary. That's why the, the, the seven is chosen there for a reason. Uh, and it's really a representation of how Jesus is walking throughout all the churches or, or throughout all of his called out people throughout, um, uh, throughout history. So, he's, so when we take that under consideration, we can see that uh, Jesus is intimately involved, cares about, and knows uh, what's going on in the churches, even in our time period today. And so the book of Revelation is meant to give us hope even today, because a lot of people are like, you know, they, th they think that God is absent. They're, they're, they're wondering, they're looking around at the stuff going on in the churches, and they're wondering like, well, where is God in all this? Does God, does God know about this? Does God care? Why isn't God doing anything? And really, the book of Revelation is written as much as it was for them, for us, to show us that he is still walking in the midst of his church. He sees the things that are going on in it, and has known about them even before we arrived at that time period. And so that's the message for us that we can see in the fact that Jesus walks in the midst of those, of those, of those uh, candlesticks. God knows and Jesus knows what's going on in the church throughout history, including today. And so seeing their works, uh, he reproves them. He says, as many as I love, I rebuke. Why? Because he cares about us. He wants us to be on the right track and he wants us to be redeemed. He wants, he wants to take out a people called by, uh, called by his name when he returns. He wants to take out a people that are, that are faithful. And so he has to prepare us to be ready to meet him because everyone's going to be judged according to their works. In fact, when we look at the final time period, Laodicea has to do with judgment. So we are living right now in the time of Laodicea, the time of judgment. And that happens right before uh, the second coming of Jesus. So the time, in the time of Ephesus, they had great works. They were doing all the right stuff, but they had, they had one issue. They had left their first love. So the Christians in Ephesus remained firm and faithful, but their love for Christ and their fellow members began to wane. So although the church stood firm and faithful without Christ's love, even their own lamp was in danger of going out. So we can be in the habit of doing all the right stuff, doing the right things, following uh, what we know to follow, but still lose our first love if we're not connected with Christ. So it's showing us that there's emphasis, there's importance with, with making sure that we stay in Christ and not just doing works uh, as if the works are, 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 um, are going to save us. And that's why Jesus talked about how he would divide the sheep from the goes. He talked about dividing the wheat and the tares and, uh, talk, and talking about how people would say, hey, you know, haven't I prophesied in your name? Haven't I done many wonderful works? Haven't I done all this great stuff? And Jesus says, depart from me. I never knew you. So we can be doing great stuff. We can be doing all the things that God wants us to do. But if we are not connected with Christ, we can lose our salvation. And he can say, depart from me. I never knew you because we um, were not connected with him. So while works is great and, and certainly important and needed, especially even in these times, uh, in doing those works, we need to make sure that we stay connected with our first love, and that should be Christ. Verse 5 to 7, Remember therefore from whence you are fallen, and repent and do your first works, or else I will come unto you quickly and remove your candlestick from out of his place, except you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. 
He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So Jesus gives some steps here to get reconnected with their first love. Remember from where you're fallen. So before you can repent of anything, you have to know what's right. You have to know where you've fallen from. If you can't see where you've fallen from, if you think everything you're doing is right, you can't repent. So first, they had to remember where they had fallen from. And second, they had to repent. To repent is to make a complete 180, to turn around from going in one direction to going the opposite direction, the correct direction. And the third thing is doing their first works. So they had to go back to doing what they knew was right. So the situation uh, in the church of Ephesus that's described here corresponds to the general situation and spiritual condition of the church from the time period of A.D. 31 to the time of 100 A.D. The apostolic church was characterized by love and faithfulness to the gospel, uh, but by the end of the first century, the church had began losing its fire and, uh, the, and, and of course, its first love, and departed, uh, at least somewhat, uh, from the simplicity and purity of the gospel. All right. So as we continue, we're going to explore some of the... Um, the themes in the in the other churches and in the other time periods, looking all the way down to the end of time, uh, looking at our time period today. All right, so that's all the time that we have for this evening. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these revelations that we can understand um, your truth. Help us to be prepared and ready for your soon coming. And help us, Lord, not to forget our first love, but to be connected with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for coming, everyone. Good night.